Hey, welcome to this first session of the second day of the e-learning rockstar stage. My name is Zach Batty. I'm with e-learning brothers and DevLearn was nice enough to let us sponsor this stage. So we really appreciate all of you being here. I am here with Josh Cavalier, who is the founder of Lodestone and one of the premier video training companies in the e-learning industry. We are so excited to have him here. Uh, Josh has been in the industry for 23 years. 23 years. Uh, he is also an avid home brewer. And so uh, he has said that if this presentation goes well, if anybody wants to buy him a, a, IPA. an IPA, he'd be open to it. We'll maybe have a tip jar up here or something along those lines. So without further ado, Josh Lodestone. Thanks, Zach. Hello, everybody. Oh, wait a second. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh Cavalier, and welcome to Micro Video Strategies for Rockstars. Over the next 45 minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and give you as much information as I humanly can about how to produce optimal video content. Uh, I am going to be doing it without a net because I have no audio. So, I will have to describe for you what's happening, and we're gonna have to use theater of the, theater of the mind. So, without further ado, Let's talk about what we know about today's learners. Uh, in today's environment, we have massive acceleration of media, uh, specifically video content, and it's a challenge. And as we have various ways of consuming that content, we have an acceleration of people using their devices to view it. So uh, this statistic, which is from Horowitz Research, states that 76% of people will watch a micro video weekly, especially if you're like flipping through Facebook and you're looking at that feed, um, you're seeing a lot of micro video content. 44% of that group of people watch it daily. So we now see content consumption patterns increase in regards to video consumption. So, there we go, okay. So one thing that we know about rock music is that it sounds better on vinyl. Sometimes you got to go back before you go forward. So in looking at the history of micro video at mass scale, one of the first examples that I found was actually Sesame Street. Children's Television Workshop premeditated short form video back in the early 70s at mass scale. And so again, I don't have audio, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look at one of those videos describing the letter U. And I'll just, maybe I'll just kind of give a voiceover while this plays. All right. U. Umbrella. Up. U. Right? So what's fascinating about that implementation is actually there's a foundation here. And as part of that video, what you see is that saying the letter U is what we call a prime. Now, most of you know about priming the learner. Now, when we do our micro videos, we are actually going to prime the learner so that they validate that this video is for them. It's also going to allow you to set in their mind what is going to happen with the schema Right? Are we going to add on to the schema in their head? Is it something that they have never heard of before? Or are they an expert at it and they're going to skip the video? So priming is critical. The next part is that we are going to optimize the content for human consumption. And what I mean by that is reducing cognitive load so that it is easy to process, to go from short term to temporary to long term memory. That is that is why we're here, right? And we want to we want to go ahead and get content into long-term memory, so we want to optimize that content for viewing. Reflection. It's okay to pause, right? So, the reflection is an opportunity to set that into long-term memory. I want to go ahead and review with you what we just covered, so that you have an opportunity to park it. All right. And so this structure that was in this video from Sesame Street leveraged this structure. One of the things that rock stars do is play to sold out shows. What this means is that they have the audience's attention fully. 
and that's another aspect of micro video is that you are creating personalized content for the learner. And so one of the things I want to talk about and how do we personalize that, we, ask, we have to understand how the brain works. And so I want to talk about system one and system two. Now system one and system two is a reoccurring topic that comes up in brain science and simply it's just that system one is our animal brain and system two is going to be higher level thinking. But unfortunately humans are lazy and we don't like system two. And so what we're trying to do is go ahead and balance between system one, which is the emotional reaction part of our brain, versus system two, which is, I need you to think about this and park it in your head, right? So, let's do a test. You don't know what's on the next slide. Let's see how your brain reacts. Right, you, so you had some kind of immediate reaction. Maybe a second thought was, why is she so pissed off? So, right, and so, but it was a gut reaction, right? So, <clears throat> I'm a little disappointed because there's no music on the next slide because I was gonna play Back in Black. So you're gonna have to mentally think in your mind that he's gonna play Back in Black. I'm only gonna go ahead and show four numbers on the screen, only four. And I want you to do in five seconds is figure out this calculation. Ready and go. Quickly, who's got it? Come on. Dun, da da dun, da da dun, da 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 Nobody has it? 408. Okay, so what just happened? You just kicked into system two, right? And so this is the balance, this is the dance that we do with our videos, our micro video content is to optimize it for human consumption. And so there are different ways that we can make that orchestration happen. Here's one more. Oh gosh, I can't do this because of audio, but let me see if I could talk you through it. So another thing that's gonna happen here is that this is an awareness test. And what I'd like for you to do is in this awareness test, I want you to count the number of times that the team in white passes the basketball. All right, some of you may have seen this. Don't give it away. Um, let's go ahead and try this out. All right, count the number of times the team in white passes the basketball. Okay, so the number of times was 13, but did you see the moonwalking bear? Let's watch it again. So what happened there is that your system, I know, is that crazy? Your system two was working and system one, which is right there in front of you, was, it wasn't available. And so again, we wanna go ahead and orchestrate system one and system two, and some of you already caught it. I put one subliminal slide in there. Uh, yeah, okay, so. The other thing that I wanna talk about, just kind of brain science-y thing, is pupil dilation. So one of the other things that happens when people are affected by system one is that they, it happens so quick is that the pupil remains intact. But what happens with system two, when you're thinking, uh, it actually expands, right? And studies have shown, and by the way, uh, if you get this deck after the conference, the empirical data will be in the notes, okay? So I'm not just, right, okay, so. Um, what happens is that if system two becomes too taxed, the pupil shuts and you give up, okay? And so what's happening is I'm going through this presentation like the AV stuff is going on that's kind of jacking up my presentation. That's actually taxing your system too and that's when you look at your phone and go, what else should I be doing, right? So um, we want to balance that out because if you tax system two, 
during the course of a video, viewers will check out. We don't want to tax that, so we want to balance it out. And there we go. Okay, so another thing, and this is just fun stuff. Why we got to make it fun? Glucose levels. Is Julie Dirksen around here? Okay, so Julie, <laughs> Julie will talk about this too. Uh, glucose levels. If you watch a video after you eat, you have a higher percentage of retaining the information. So there was a study done in Israel where judges were paroling inmates. And these judges had an average of six minutes to determine whether somebody was paroled or not. What the study did is that they looked at the percentage of parolees, people who were actually paroled, before and after these judges ate. And what happened is around 67% of these parolees got off after the judges ate lunch. And the reason for that is because their glucose levels are up and they perform higher system two functions. Before lunch, you start running out of juice and you kick back into system one. So if you're delivering your micro videos and pushing them out, do it at times after people eat. All right. And also flow. So flow is where you're in a higher level state of thought but you remain at it. So you can actually be in higher level thinking, but it's so incredibly easy that there's no tax. You're, the brain's not taxed. And you can actually create videos to get people in a state of flow, which is actually pretty cool. All right, sometimes when you're a rock star, you gotta crank it up to 11. And what that means is that we wanna go ahead and make sure that we're really focused in on our media. Let's talk about total cognitive load. How does this work? So um, we have intrinsic, which means that the stuff is just tough. We have extraneous, which is this environment that you're experiencing right now. And we have germane. So that's you to the individual. Really quick. So this is the work of Dr. Richard Bayer. And this affects the way that we produce our micro videos so I want to kind of walk you through what the brain goes through as it's consuming content, in addition to system one and system two. So we have text, it could be auditory, it could be visual, and then we actually have a visual image that goes into short term or sensory memory. And then from there, the text is either heard in the head in an auditory fashion or visual. Now, it's up to you to, <laughs> it's up to, you to determine whether you want to pay attention or not, right? That's selecting. So, I mean, if this presentation was boring, you, you might be here, but you could check out and not pay attention, or you have actively have content coming in. Working memory. So you only got about 20 seconds, people, of this. If you tax people out, you're going to tax their system two, and they will not be able to remember anything else, and those pupils are going to dilate back down. That gives them time to organize the content into mental models, right? We want to get into long-term memory, so we're going to go ahead and have it integrate. You may take your pictures now. These channels that we have here are an auditory channel and a visual channel, and this is the key. Unfortunately, most of the media that we are exposed to are, is for advertising and marketing, which is a dance of emotion. And to produce effective micro video content, you must drop that emotion down. Okay? I didn't say remove it. I said you want to use it strategically, right? You got to drop it down at certain points. And then what we want to do is that when the content is delivered and we get the brain into a system two function, we need to make sure that there's a balance between the audio and video so it doesn't tax system two, right? And so what happens is that you see yourself watching these videos that have background music in it. You're like, I want to put background music in my training videos. And that's extraneous content. And it will tax system two, which will make people check out. And we don't want that to happen. We want it to be consumable. So the essential media that's coming into the brain, that's what we want 
anything else is incidental, and that's my challenge to you, is to be mindful of what is incidental. What can I do to reduce cognitive load, to make my micro video content easy to watch? So again, in seconds, you have a half second for a sensory, you have about 20 seconds for your temporary storage, and the long term is infinite. It's, you know, we may not be able to recall things right away, <laughs> okay? Especially after last night. Okay, so, uh, things that you can do. The visual channel is overloaded. What do you do? Remove written words from the screen and add audio, right? So, you don't want to go ahead and put text on the screen and have somebody reading the text, all right? That's, so you guys already know that. That's an easy one. So we want to go ahead and move it from the visual into the auditory channel, balancing it out. Next. Oh, okay. So I was going to go ahead and show you an example, but because I have no audio portion of it, I'm still going to show it. Because what, the, what this video is going to show you to do is how to add or install a plugin into EndNote, okay, which is just a software tool. So let's take a look at this, um, but without the audio. Looks great, and then you get this. This is EndNote. Please go, <laughs> right? I mean, immediately, where do you look? There wasn't even an audio portion, and your system too got taxed within five seconds. So we want to go ahead and simplify the screen, add visual cues, reduce the cognitive load, all right? Rock stars also like to destroy hotel rooms. Now I have no slide or anything about this, I just wanted to put it in the presentation. I mean, <laughs> where's he going with this? Ah, all right, so incidental, essential and incidental overloaded. Like I said, remove background audio, easy. Again, these, these tasty videos or these videos on how to cook stuff, they have the music blasting in the background. So you gotta ask yourself the question, is this optimal for learning? Could I actually watch this once and execute on it? Probably not, you may have to go ahead and watch it again. I'm not even gonna show it, you guys have seen these. Let's keep rolling. So if you have confusing visuals and spoken words, other things that you can do is like place the visuals near the action, all right? So I know I was, I was kind of dissing the tasty videos, but watch, watch the placement of the text next to the action video. Pizza dough. <laughs> And I, I'm really apologized because I know you guys have already tapped out on the hors d'oeuvres, so I'm, so I'm really sorry. Look at that. Uh, so that. They just told you about the salt. But you see the placement of the text? In other words, you're watching the action. Your eyes are already there. Why not put the text in the same location? That reduces the cognitive load. Yummy. One other thing that you need to be aware of, that even if your videos have high cognitive load issues, today we have reverse modality. So reverse modality is the ability for me to go on my device and scrub back and watch it again and scrub back and watch it again. Back when I was in grade school, that was not the case. The modality was walk the cart into the room and then you get excited, start the projector, Stop the projector, turn on the lights, discuss, turn off the light, you get the idea. So even if you have issues with your video, just the fact that the user is scrubbing back and forth is an opportunity from you from an analytics standpoint to see where the area of concern is at. And you can pull those analytics back. I'm telling you guys, that's essential, all right? I'm gonna get to analytics hopefully here, um, but when you look at the view data, those points that users are scrubbing to is gold. If you do not have a plan for analytics for your videos, you are missing out on a huge opportunity, okay? There are many video content management system vendors in this hall. Talk to them. 
show me your dashboard. What are you tracking? Right? You got you to get that information. Okay, let's get into it. What is my definition of a micro video? In my world, that is 60 seconds or less. That's where I play. Is it possible to have micro video content that is longer? Of course it is. Is it possible to have multiple micro videos in a single video for macro content? Yes, you can. But just for this conversation, I want to go ahead and just play here at 60 seconds. So, when we're talking about consumption of a video, we are dealing with moments of learner intent. So typically your micro videos, your users want to know a fact, perform a task, make a decision, or follow a passion. They typically fall into one of these categories. Take a picture. Now, I don't, again, I do not have an audio portion of this. So uh, this was just a, a video on how to um, speak in a foreign language, Mandarin, and uh, how to say hello and goodbye. OK? I'm just going to, well, you know what? Cantonese, sorry, is it Cantonese? Okay, so he's going at this here. Now, just a couple things to point out. The movement in the background, high cognitive load. The logo flashing in the bottom left-hand corner, high cognitive load, okay? Even the, the SME centered on the middle of the screen, that causes visual tension. We, as humans, we don't like to see people directly in front of us. That makes us a little nervous. For those of you that want to see that in practice, go watch a Stanley Kubrick movie, okay? All the one-point perspective was intentionally done to make you freak out. So if you wonder why you see interview videos and the human is off to the side, there's a reason for that because it makes us feel comfortable, okay? But there is a time and place for this. If you want to go ahead and like you're doing a safety video, you can use that to your advantage to cause tension in the moment. Let's carry on. Okay, so he's just going through here. So anyways, he's going through these various modalities even in 60 seconds of content. Oh yeah, the reflection, that just adds to the cognitive load. We don't want that stuff. Just flat graphics, please. Okay, so uh, what happens though is that even within a 60 second video, you can break down all of these into micro moments. This is how the scripting begins. If you have a learning objective, you can go ahead and break it down so that the essential tasks or the essential delivery can be done in an efficient way. So the challenge to you guys is to go ahead and see how can I go ahead and effectively compress these steps down to optimize the content and reduce the amount of time. We are in a fist fight for attention. Do not do a 15 second B-roll open to your videos, <laughs> okay? Get into it. Oh, this is a good one. I'm sorry, look it up on YouTube. This is Bob Bergen, three second video. He would teach you how to talk like Porky Pig. It's a big crowd pleaser. I don't have an audio, so look it up. But anyways, Bob even, he'll break it down to where you count the words, you do four sounds, you wrinkle your nose, do a third sound, put it together. I didn't practice, so I'm not going to do it. All right. But even there's micro moments there. <clears throat> uh, another thing to be concerned about is as you begin to compress time, okay, bad things begin to happen. Don't, in, just for the sake of cutting video down, that is a bad move. You must be mindful. You must be strategic. I'm just going to blow through these. Oh, this is a good one. This actually is a video that doesn't have any audio. So this is from Lowe's Corporation, and this is a six-second video that actually teaches you how to put up a photo collage on your wall at home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? That's so cool. And so, yes, you can teach somebody a task in six seconds. This is like a glorified, glorified flip book, right? That's pretty cool. But even within six seconds, we have individual steps that can be done. 
So if you have old content, like paper-based content, and there are figures in that content, and you're looking to get it over into micro video content, this is a great way to do it. But be careful. <laughs> as I mentioned, as you reduce your content, you can run into problems or misrepresent the information. We don't want to do that. So for instance, Lowe's also put out a video on how to replace a backsplash. Anybody do this? All right, yeah. Uh, because, uh, well, let's just take a look at it. Let's see how easy it is. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, just float this up here real quick. I'm gonna put these spacers in and just do that and float it and then uh, we're done. Woo, okay, so I'm gonna watch this and I'm gonna go back to my wife like, honey, we can do this. Let's do it. No problem, we're knock it out. Saturday morning, we got this. So there I am. <laughs> you know, I attempted this and I found out that my kitchen wasn't square. Neither were the cabinets. And so it's like 12 hours later. So if you... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That was system one. That was system one. Uh, if you want to test your marriage, this is a good way to do it. Okay, so... So what, hap what does happen when we get down to system one? Now one of the other things that can happen is that even though something is a system one, you can actually put it in reflexive memory. Meaning that if you hear it often enough, you're not gonna react to it, you could possibly ignore it. So we have that kind of activity going on also. So it's like uh, you know, folks that live in the city, like in New York City, a siren, <laughs> right? But if I was out in the country, I'd perk up pretty quick. You get the idea. So, oh, and I can't do this here because I, I don't have audio. Essentially what it was is that you're going to get an emotional reaction. I will still give you an emotional reaction with no audio. Okay, so let's take a look at these. And I'm not singing. Okay, you, got, you guys ready for another emotional reaction, right? This is just system one. Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, I mean, immediately you had a reflexive response to that stimulus because you've experienced it before. Maybe not Dell or maybe not Star Wars for some of you, but for those of you that did, you emotionally had a response. We want to leverage that as educators. The only thing you can do in the first five seconds is elicit emotion, system one, okay? And we also want to go ahead and not abuse it. And what I mean by that is say, so let's say that we are going to leverage micro video content within our instructional flow and at the end of a knowledge journey, we want to create performance support videos that are gonna get pushed out using one of these wonderful systems that are out here for mobile delivery. Why would I put emotion at the beginning of those videos when it's a follow-up training event? They're already bought in. They just want the information. I don't have to go ahead and give them a musical interlude or a, an intro at the beginning of that video. So I would remove it, right? So it's not every video you're gonna leverage emotion. Sometimes you just wanna get into the information. Now, if a viewer is coming in cold, meaning that they're doing a search and they're coming right into it, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and leverage emotion. All right, now, the moment of truth for a creative unit is the first five seconds in the previous lifetime, it was the last 10. This is Drew Paniotu. He was the former Best Buy's chief marketing officer. This quote was from like six years ago. They even knew in marketing that these devices, these mobile devices, you have 10 seconds, folks. If it's not personalized and it's not for you, and you know it, you're out. So you're gonna have to go ahead and when you create your micro video content, make sure you check the personas and do your audience analysis. All right, let's get into some formulas. This is the base formula that my company uses when we go ahead and we, we engage our clients for micro video. So the first part of it is emotional pull. So emotional pull is what you guys experience as a system one function to where we're gonna orchestrate that first five seconds to pull people in. Now, what will happen is that over time, persona data is gonna be collected off your users 
and that is going to be auto-generated by an AI stack. But until that time, you have to create the content, okay? The next part is the prime. Now, a priming statement would be something like, hi, I'm Josh Cavalier. Let's take a look at how to create a micro video. That's a priming statement. So a priming statement is getting yourself in the ready position. You're getting the brain in the ready position. How am I adding on to my schema? Have I seen this before? No, I'm adding on to my schema. So getting into the ready position. It's also like during this presentation how I kind of, you know, like, oh, coming up next, right, is a multiplication problem. That's priming. The content. We want to go ahead and create a very low cognitive experience that we shift the user from system one to system two so that they are in a higher level of thought, but it is optimized for consumption and we do not tax cognitive load so that when they are using system two, they're in a state of flow, right? If you tax system two and there's too much cognitive load, the pupils dilate back down, they check out, and they are now in a passive consumption. Passive consumption. If they make it through the content, at the end we have a reflection, which is that moment where you revisit what you just covered to give the opportunity to take it from temporary storage into long-term memory. And that's how you create a micro video, right? So that would be a reflection. Emotional push, I haven't talked about this yet. Emotional push is a call to action. It is the send off. It is you want to take emotion and you want to jack it back up to get people pumped up about maybe watching the next video in the series or to go ahead and this new knowledge that they have gained to apply it in the work area, right? So we can leverage emotion off the end as a send off. It's not required all the time, but if they're coming in cold on some content, you can leverage it appropriately. Now, has anyone ever heard of this? Monroe's motivated sequence? It's kind of out of our flywheel. So this is used in advertising and marketing. This is the structure of a 30 second ad. You see the correlation? Right? We're just advertisers of knowledge, <laughs> okay? And so what we have here is gain learners attention. Oh my, that's Gagne, right? Gain attention. Then we identify the need, satisfy that need, visualize the solution, and then the call to action. We are just tweaking advertising for knowledge. And the key here is the orchestration of emotion. During advertising, they will mess with your mind and get you emotionally tied through all the way so that the call of action is implemented. We want to knock that emotion down so that we can go ahead and allow users to think about what they're consuming in an optimal format. One of the tools that we use when they're, with our clients that are not familiar with creating micro videos is something called planning blocks. A planning block is an item in a video that potentially could have a high cognitive experience. For instance, we discussed a headshot and with a headshot, if it's straight on, that could increase the cognitive load and so on. So each of these blocks can potentially have a low cognitive experience or something that is high. So also notice that we have a video and auditory channel. So we try to balance that out. And simply all we do is go ahead and set up the blocks and see if there's a potential high cognitive load situation. All right. This is just an exercise. Typically after using these blocks for a few months, they don't use the blocks anymore. So if you have a series of 60 micro videos that you're creating and you're premeditating and thinking about the architecture, you use the blocks as a tool to verify and validate and go through checklists whether it's a potential high cognitive load. Now when you do it enough, you will know just by viewing or hearing and viewing the content, whether it's a high cognitive load experience, okay? So this is a tool that we use just to start out with. And you could also use, I challenge you to try this. Try to do a block and see if, um, you know, what you're creating is a high cognitive load. So that's how we would do the map, okay? So in this example, we have the title sequence, 
we have a headshot with a voiceover and some music in the background. We then carry the voiceover over to a title sequence for the priming. Hi, I'm Josh Cavalier. This is how you create a micro video. The content, we have a, a screen recording with an animation, a voiceover, and a sound effect. You think there might be a potential for a high cognitive load experience at that point? Darn tootin'. Because um, about just a number of blocks. You can see what's going on there. And then we have the reflection and the emotional push off the end. We cool? Getting that? All right, so I got five minutes. Now what happens, uh, let me go back. What happens if I have a, you know, you're like, but hey, I, I want to do two learning objectives in this video. I want to do three learning objectives in this video. That's fine. I'm not, again, I'm not telling you guys to go ahead and create 60 second videos. That's not the key. If you're able to get your, if you're, if you're able to get your viewer in a high state of flow, you can go for a longer period of time, but we want to orchestrate it. So in this example, let's say we have two learning objectives, and what we're going to do is go ahead and use a transitional emotional pull push. That's when we actually bring the SME back on the screen. So the first part is we'll take a look at a priming statement. Let's now take a look at how to produce optimal content. That's so I'm taking you and I'm concluding one learning objective and then emotionally pushing you towards the second, right? So we want to go ahead and we can use that orchestration to actually create longer form macro video content. Let's get into some specifics. Titles, yes, we can do titles at the beginning. Gain attention, learning objectives, Gagne's conditions of learning. We can leverage that for our video titles. I really want to get to and talk about headshots in my last five minutes here. There's some cool stuff I want to share with you real quick. Headshots. So with a headshot, you always want to, rock stars always want to perfect their look, right? That's key to be a rock star. Now, with headshots, you never, get a, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, right? So there was an interesting study. And actually, it's another one out of Israel. They're doing a lot of work over there. So uh, these scientists went ahead and put you know, electrodes on these rats. And what they did is they went ahead and set them in an environment where they've never seen each other before. Okay? Coming in cold. I don't know who you are. You don't know me. And what they found out is that when you don't see somebody for the first time, and you look them in the eye, your theta increases. Now, if you do a little bit of research on what the theta waves in your brain do, they essentially get you in the state of learning. You're in a ready state, but it's positive. I mean, you can have negative situations with theta, but it's positive. So having a human on the screen is advantageous. But then they put the rats back together over and over and over again. You know what happened? Theta dropped. It wasn't as exciting. I've seen you before. That's the reason why, if you're using SMEs, you want to change the background, change their clothes, different locations. You'll begin to increase theta again. Think about rock stars or pop stars. What did Madonna do during her career? Did she look the same? Nope. She changed her look. Wow, Katy Perry cut her hair. It is now blonde. <laughs> Theta goes up, right? So theta elicits positive emotions and increases cognitive process, which allows us to learn. I am all about having the SME on the screen strategically. A couple minutes. Yes, so we talked about head on. We want to go to this side. And also just from a creative standpoint, you can go ahead and put additional information on the screen. Now, what about this? We see this a lot. If anyone watches Twitch TV or has kids that are watching people that are playing video games, to where you have the instructor simultaneously on the screen at the same time as the information is up there, I personally, uh, it doesn't jive for me. We actually, at Lodestone, we toggle back and forth between the SME and the slide and do things like that. But, you know, I, what's the data? <laughs> Are you just making it up? No. There are. I hope there is. We're going to skip that. There's studies out there on this. So a team actually went ahead and did an eye tracking study 
and there were, a group of people were presented baseline information that was then tested against whether, you know, whether they paid attention on. So they took a test after consuming this information. One group had the person on the screen, another group did not. What happened? Well, after the eye tracking study, it's obvious that people were looking at the face. But the results of the test were inconclusive. They tested out the same. So you're going to have to make your own decision how you want to handle it. Again, my personal preference is to toggle back and forth because I believe it reduces cognitive load. But the, the study was inconclusive. All right? Okay. My time is up. Uh, again, my name is Josh Cavalier with Lodestone. Um, if you want to go ahead and discuss further, I'll be hanging out here for a few minutes. But again, thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. I wish you all the best, and we'll catch you down the road. So, everybody give a big hand for Josh. Wasn't that great?